Second generation Ryzen CPUs are finally upon us and over the last couple of weeks I've been tinkering with the R7 2700X, AMD's new flagship desktop processor. The short answer is that AMD have done a ton of refining here over first gen to bring us an amazing piece of hardware. Now when it came to the first generation Ryzen CPUs, I had two main issues. The first one was the rather poor memory compatibility, and the second one was the fairly average single threaded performance when it compared to uh, what Intel had to offer. If there's anything that you guys can take away from this review, it's that both of those issues, issues that I've been fairly vocal about mind you, have been dramatically improved. Before we go any further, let's take a quick look at what AMD are bringing to the table here spec wise. Starting from the bottom, we've got the 2600, the 2600X, the 2700, and the processor that we'll be looking at today, the new flagship CPU, the 2700X. As you could probably guess, these processors are direct successors to the Ryzen 5 1600 and 1600X, and the Ryzen 7 1700 and 1700X. AMD are also utilizing a new process here from Global Foundries, which they're branding as 12 nanometer, and this incorporates stricter design rules, a new layout, a focus on performance per watt and also claims a 10% boost in performance. This may be the ticket to allow these processors to boost up to 4.35 GHz whereas first gen was restricted to around 4.1. And as with first gen, overclocking performance should be quite comparable among all four CPUs depending on the binning process that is at hand here and we'll delve into overclocking in just a minute. Firstly, let's take a look at the 2700X and right away you'll notice that a couple of numbers here have increased over first generation. The max boost clock is now a respectable 4.35 GHz via AMD's XFR, and the other spec which has increased is the TDP, now reaching a toasty 105 watts. AMD are combating that extra heat though with a new improved stock cooler, the Wraith Prism. And yes, I said stock, this beastly little thing comes included with the 2700X and it does make that $329 price tag a little bit more reasonable in my opinion. We've got copper heat pipes in direct contact with the integrated heat spreader on the CPU, a massive fin stack and an RGB fan mounted at the top. There's a 4 pin RGB header as well if you've got an adapter for your motherboard and also a 3 pin header for USB at the end as well. According to hardware info this thing can spin up to 3500 RPM at full speed and if you don't want to tinker with the fan profiles or anything like that you can toggle between two fan profiles on the cooler itself and here's what those sound like real quick. So how does this thing actually perform? Well for an 8 core CPU operating at 4 GHz this cooler is definitely pushing its limits. I tested both the high and low RPM fan modes in a couple different applications and with the 2700X operating at stock clock speed and voltage, in the most intense workloads we see the 2700X sitting just a hair under 80 degrees C. Keep in mind though that this was tested on an open test bench with the results adjusted to reflect an ambient room temperature of 20 degrees C. So although we are a good distance from the processor thermal throttling at load, we don't have a lot of overhead when it comes to overclocking, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Now, new processors also mean a chipset refresh, and I've been lucky enough to play around with two X470 boards before launch, the MSI Gaming M7 and the Gigabyte Gaming 7, both of which are excellent options and will have full reviews coming up very shortly. For the purpose of testing the 2700X, I did use the Gaming M7 from MSI since I had the most time with it, but spoiler alert, I did compare both motherboards extensively when it came to the 2700X boost performance out of the box, and both the Gigabyte and MSI board performed identically, at least in the four main applications which I tested. Overclocking performance was very similar as well, but before that, I briefly want to talk about the behavior of the frequency boost across all eight cores for the 2700X. Now, seeing 4.35 GHz published all over the web and also printed on the box of the 2700X, it would be easy to assume that as a fairly common and frequent range for the CPU to boost to, but this isn't the case. 
this. Instead, the CPU will dynamically adjust its frequencies based on the type of load that's being thrown at it. For example, in games, the 2700X will happily sit between 4 and 4.1 gigahertz depending on how demanding it is. But in more stressful scenarios like rendering a 3D scene in Blender, the 2700X will lock all eight cores to something a little bit lower, 3.95 gigahertz in this particular example. I'll have a full video coming out very soon which looks at the frequency boost behavior in depth among several scenarios to give you guys a better understanding of the actual operating frequencies of the 2700X and not what's just printed on the box. Okay, finally, let's talk about overclocking. Now, understand that how high any given CPU can overclock varies from part to part. So for example, my 2700X may be good, bad, or somewhere in the middle. At this point, I don't really know because I haven't spoken to any other media. I can tell you that I did receive a retail part, so I am expecting my results here to be fairly common. I have had the 2700X for about two weeks by the time of this review, and I've spent at least 10 to 12 hours testing the overclocking performance and seeing just how far this thing can be pushed. To cut through all of that trial and error, the max stable overclock that I was able to achieve along with 3200 megahertz memory was 4.25 gigahertz across all eight cores. Now, I did manage 4.35 gigahertz at 1.46 volts with memory speeds at 2133 megahertz, but ultimately this did net worse performance. So like you probably are now, I am a little bit underwhelmed when it comes to this sort of overclocking performance. And although it can be considered an overclock across all eight cores, it's still 100 megahertz below what is actually printed on the box as the max boost frequency. And in terms of voltage, I was pushing the limit here of what can be considered safe for daily use. On the MSI Gaming M7, 4.25 gigahertz was stable at 1.425 volts. I needed a tiny bit more on the Gaming 7 from Gigabyte at 1.435 volts and I also tested the Asus B350 Strix which features a measly four phase VRM for the CPU and 4.25 gigahertz was stable there at 1.45 volts. I will have a video coming up soon regarding why I would probably recommend against using a B350 board for such a power hungry CPU. If you want to see VRM throttling in action don't forget to hit that subscribe button. So yeah, 4.3 gigahertz seems to be right around the upper limit of what you can expect on these new processors if you are going to be using them alongside fast memory. Now, with the overclock in place, the Wraith Prism was no longer sufficient when it came to cooling the 8-core beast unless it was in a gaming load. So I did have to switch to an all-in-one liquid cooler in a push-pull configuration. If you are going to be overclocking the 2700X or the 2700 for that matter and really pushing their limits, an aftermarket cooler is absolutely necessary for heavy workloads. I would consider a 240mm AIO an absolute minimum. So a huge thanks to Thermaltake for providing the coolers for this review, otherwise overclocking would have been impossible. Now, last topic before we get to the benchmarks is memory support. Has it improved or are we still dealing with scanning QVL lists on the board manufacturer's website? Well, I can tell you that I did test a fairly common memory kit, which I have had issues with in the past on B350 and X370 boards, a 16 gigabyte Corsair Vengeance LPX kit clocked at 3200 megahertz. And I had no problems here at all on both the X470 boards that I tested, by simply clicking XMP and having the memory running at its full rated speed. I didn't try overclocking it further, maybe I'll try that in a separate video, but I just have to say it's a real breath of fresh air just to enable XMP and forget about it. I look forward to seeing what other reviewers experience is on this topic. Hopefully this is an issue that AMD can iron out altogether and we can just move past. And so finally, let's talk about how this thing actually performs. All tested was completed on the MSI X470 Gaming M7 7 and 16 gigabytes of 3200 megahertz RAM. And of course, the CPU was tested both on auto and overclocked to 4.25 gigahertz, which we talked about earlier. Let's start out with the usual opener here in Cinebench R15 using all threads. And right away, we can see the R7 2700X claiming the top score, 1801 at stock and 1912 when overclocked. Almost a 200 point lead over its predecessor, the R7 1700, when that was overclocked to 3.9. We're also over 
300 points in front of the 8700K at 5 gigahertz, and this should give you a pretty solid idea of the raw multi-threading performance of this CPU. When switching to a single thread, this has been Ryzen's downfall in the previous generation, but it appears that second gen is really putting that increased clock speed to work. The 2700X tops out at about 176 when overclocked, and we can see Precision Boost and XFR in full effect in this scenario, where stock is pretty much matching the result at 4.25 gigahertz. We're still about 50 points behind Intel's Coffee Lake when that's overclocked to 5 gigahertz, but a 20 point improvement over previous gen is definitely something that we can commend. Our final rendering benchmark here using Blender shows us that the 2700X can definitely be utilized in real world scenarios and applications. And the performance difference over its Intel competitor, the 8700K, is significant and worth noting. Of course, a discrete GPU is always the recommended device here if you have one. And since the 2700X doesn't have a integrated GPU, it's definitely an important note. Still though, the 2700X does top the chart and offers some very impressive rendering performance. Shifting gears now to compression, and we can see that the 2700X is closing the gap on what was otherwise an untouched win for the 8700K. And I think another one or 200 megahertz on the 2700X, and we'd be pretty much matching its performance. For decompression though, Ryzen has always provided impressive performance here, but the 2700X is venturing into previously uncharted territory for these mainstream CPUs. We see a significant lead here over the overclocked 8700K, and the performance improvement improvement over the R7 1700 is clearly displayed here as well. All right, what about content creation then, specifically in the Adobe suite? Now, this is an area where Intel's Coffee Lake have previously dominated thanks to the ideal balance of high core and thread count, but also a high clock speed. But the 2700X here is showing up and taking care of business. Here we're looking at export times of a 1080p video clip, and I'll be honest guys, I was not expecting this at all. The improvements here over previous gen are definitely welcome, and whatever secret source AMD are pouring onto these new CPUs, I definitely want to see more. Taking a look at video stabilization now using the warp stabilizer effect, and again, I wasn't expecting the R7 2700X here to be doing so well. And don't take that the wrong way, it's just that this task scales incredibly well with clock speed and previous gen gave me some pretty average results. Here though, the 2700X is showing us that not only is it a multi-threaded beast, but its argument for high single-threaded performance is definitely growing. And our last content creation benchmark here is primarily single threaded, taking a look at just how fast each CPU can analyze a 10 second 4K clip for 3D motion tracking. The 8700K at 5 gigahertz gives us the quickest time with 132 seconds for the analysis to finish, with the overclocked 2700X about 30 seconds slower at 166.3 seconds. What's most interesting to me here though is the negligible margin between the stock and overclocked 2700 X. And this could definitely be an example of Precision Boost 2 and XFR2 in full effect. Okay, time to get to the benchmarks that most of you guys are here for, and that's how this thing does in terms of gaming performance. I had two main questions going into these benchmarks. How much of a performance boost are we getting over stock? And is it going to be worth upgrading over previous generation? Starting off with Battlefield 1, and here we can see that the performance improvement is definitely there over the R7 1700. About 5 FPS on average, and roughly 15 FPS when comparing the lowest 1%. We're getting roughly i5 8400 performance here, but remember that this is high frame rate testing with a 1080 Ti in 1080p, aiming to isolate the CPU as the tested variable. So of course with lower frame rates there is going to be a lower difference. Moving on to GTA 5, we can see that performance improvement again over the previous generation thanks to that increase in clock speed, but we are still behind the faster current gen i5 and i7 chips. The general idea for gaming so far is that we're not quite matching the Intel CPUs in gaming, but the gap is definitely closing. Now something I want to draw your attention to here is that there doesn't seem to be much reason at all to overclock the 2700X when it comes to gaming performance alone, as the differences here are between 1-2 to FPS. 
As a quick detour, I wanna show you what the precision boost here is doing in the GTA 5 benchmark. And as we can see, we are maintaining above four gigahertz for all eight cores. As I showed before, the 2700X won't boost this high in intensive workloads like video editing or rendering, something that we'll be looking at in a separate video, but it's nice to see here that this does maintain above four gigahertz on all cores out of the box. In Civilization 6, we're looking at the average turn time here for the built-in benchmark, and the single-threaded performance boost that we're getting here is definitely appreciated. However, this is one area where Precision Boost could not catch the overclocked performance, and is something that we also see in our graphics benchmark, with about a 5 FPS lead in both average and the lowest 1%. This game scales insanely well for high clock speed CPUs, so despite AMD's improvement here, the 8700K still takes the top score, and honestly will do so for pretty much any game. PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds has shown relatively average performance previously for Ryzen CPUs, and unfortunately the scaling here, although improved once again, is still about 10-12 to 12 FPS behind an overclocked i5 or i7. We're getting roughly i3-8100 performance on average here, but the lowest 1% of frames will definitely be more stable thanks to more cores and threads available. A similar trend follows for Witcher 3, performance is going to be somewhere between previous gen Ryzen CPUs and the faster i5 and i7s. Note that the overclock does give us a nice boost here, so the performance gains of Precision Boost 2 are somewhat unpredictable. But as a safe bet, and of course to get the most out of the CPU anyway, I would always recommend overclocking. And our last gaming benchmark here, Ghost Recon Wildlands at 1080p high settings. The performance is essentially the same for the top 5 CPUs here, sitting at around 94 to 95 FPS for the lowest 1% of frames. And the comparison comparison here that most people care about is the 2700X against the i7-8700K, in which case there's about a 10% difference on average. How you justify that difference is up to you, but the bottom line is, if you're interested in getting the most gaming performance out of your CPU as you can, the objective answer is to still go with Intel, especially if you're gaming at 100Hz or above. Can you game on the 2700 or 2700X though? Of course, and honestly the performance difference is going to be fairly small until you start hitting those higher frame rates. Of course though, this CPU is not primarily targeted towards gaming, although it does do pretty well. Well, you should be looking at the 2700X and the 2700 for their outstanding multi-threaded performance. If your main focus is CPU rendering, encoding, or decoding, the Ryzen 7 chip does have the clear edge over the similarly priced 8700K, and the fact that it's closing the gap in gaming performance as well is pretty exciting to say the least. Now aside from the massive performance boost that we're getting over previous gen, I just want to close by saying that as a both reviewer and a consumer of these products, it's been very pleasing to use uh, the X470 chipset along the new Ryzen 2000 CPUs. It's a massive improvement over the launch that we got last year and uh, memory compatibility has been flawless and so far no blue screens. As I've mentioned throughout this review, we are just getting warmed up for these new Ryzen CPUs and there's going to be a ton of content on this channel, so don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. I'm interested to hear what you guys think of these new CPUs. Are they better or worse than what you're expecting? Are you going to upgrade? And if so, which CPU are you going to choose? And let me know why down below. As always guys, a huge thanks for watching and as always, I'll see you all in the next one.